Good morning, everyone. Welcome to session three in our series of webinars. It's really great to be here with you again this morning. For those of you who haven't yet joined us in sessions, my name's Kate Rowley. I'm one of the senior Her Majesty's inspectors in the North East Yorkshire and Humber Ofsted region. I'm really delighted to be joined today by our senior leader, leaders in Ofsted's curriculum unit, Heather Fern and Jonathan Kay, who are going to take us through today's session about an effective curriculum. We've also got Kirsty, our early reading lead, and Emma Ng, our regional director here with us again. Emma, shall I pass to you for a moment? Thank you, Kate. And I wanted to welcome all of you to this, our third session in a series of five webinars that we planned really to try and support those of us working in education to get the very best for all children, because I know that's what we really want to do. We're absolutely delighted how well the earlier webinars have gone down. And if you don't know, find them on uh, YouTube. I'm sure Kate will, will give a little plug for that later. Uh, but I also very grateful to my colleagues for the time that they've put into this, uh, both those of us on screen and those behind the scenes. So thank you all and welcome to our participants. I hope you have a very enjoyable and worthwhile seminar. Kate. Thank you. So our focus so far, as you know, has been on the reading curriculum. And as we know, reading is the bedrock of the curriculum. It provides the key to successfully accessing that wider curriculum. And in this session, we're going to move on to look at that curriculum as a whole. But before we do, let's zoom out for a moment and just remind ourselves of the overall aims and the journey that we are on through these webinars. Today, we're going to reflect further on what our research tells us about building an effective curriculum. And by now, you'll be really familiar with our references to knowledge and memory. And as we can see in that second bullet, this session is about how we can best support children to know, remember and to be able to do more. So here you can see how this session today sits within our series of webinars. As I've already said, we started with reading because of it being that gateway to the wider curriculum. And as we heard in session one, if a child can learn to read accurately by the age of six, they can learn to read to learn for the rest of their life. Cracking the phonics code as soon as possible is crucial. We also considered how we can get pupils back on track if the pan pandemic has caused disruption to your phonics programme. And we emphasise that importance of consistency and fidelity with any planned intervention and the usefulness of those short, sharp bursts of teaching to get things back on track. In session two, we explored the early reading criteria in detail and considered how that might be successfully applied in schools. We also talked about secondary reading, a key component of key stages three and four. And we shone a light on the need for the urgency of addressing any gaps in pupils' phonics knowledge and the importance of developing a strategy for the promotion of reading for pleasure. As Emma said, both of these are now available um, on YouTube and you can find this by searching North East Yorkshire and Humber Ofsted curriculum webinars. In addition, we're going to make sure that we send out a direct link of all the sessions to everyone who signed up by email to today's event. So as soon as this session is available in the next um, sort of day or so, that will be there too. So as we move into session three, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, who will take you through the roadmap for the web webinar today. Well, a very good morning, everyone. And uh, we'll just turn off our, our cameras now so that we uh, don't distract yourselves or ourselves any further. And let me take you through um, what we're going to be covering today. So a very good morning. My name is Jonathan Kay. I'm a senior Her Majesty's Inspector in the curriculum unit. And uh, I'll be working with my colleague, Heather, today as we take you through some of these messages. So as you know, this presentation is entitled Curriculum in the Current Climate. You'll be reassured to know that you know, we haven't made any changes to our concept of quality. And by that, we mean you know, what we know from our research and inspection work makes for an effective curriculum. That's exactly the same now in 2021 as it was when we launched the EIF in September 2019. But given the challenges of the pandemic, we wanted to take this opportunity with you today to revisit some of Ofsted's original curriculum messages. And in particular, the role of memory and cognitive science. And we want to signpost you to some of our most recent subject research work. So a quick run through by session. In session one, we'll summarize our messages about the education inspection framework into as small a package as possible. And Heather will be with you for this session. You can of course watch the full videos of our EIF roadshows on YouTube. 
where our thinking is explained in, in around about three hours. But here today, we've drawn together all the kind of seminal slides in as short a section as possible. In session two, we'll turn our attention to memory and cognition. The wealth and scope of research in the field of cognitive science is key to our framework and judgments. It's important that we use approaches to curriculum design, pedagogy and assessment that help pupils integrate new knowledge into the long-term memory. And as you'll hear us repeat during the sessions, if nothing in the long-term memory has been altered, nothing has been learned. That quote from Sweller is an important one. Teachers with an appreciation of how learning happens are best placed to help pupils. In session three, um, we take a few moments to shine a light on our latest research. You'll perhaps have seen some of our recent series of research reviews. Well, this session allows me to explain how those reviews have come about the bigger project that they are part of and how they can be a useful reference point as you plan your curriculums in the current climate. And finally, in session four, we'll be talking specifically about catch up. We'll be back with Heather for this session. We'll build on the messages from sessions one, two and three and consider some of the best bets to bear in mind as we manage the challenges of the pandemic. We'll also share some key principles that might be useful to think about as you construct and renew your curriculums and we'll consider what this means for different subjects. Okay as I said just bear with us as we move between presenters um, this morning I'll now have a go at handing over to Heather and Heather will be taking us through session one so here we go bear with me just a second. Over to you Heather. Thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. So as John said, I'm going to be taking you through the first session, which is the longest of the four sessions today, um, and talking to you about the further, further about the importance of curriculum in that time. Now, if you have a look at the two questions um, on this slide, they're questions that we asked when we launched our new education inspection framework in 2019. And that first question, what is curriculum, in some ways could seem obvious, except that there's Diff, diff, you know, marginally different or very different definitions that might be used by different people. And so it's really important that we define what we mean by curriculum so that there's clear communication. And for us by curriculum, mean, we mean what is taught. Um, uh, so what it is that's taught and that we intend that pupils will learn. And um, the emphasis on the what might seem obvious, but sometimes the course of a teacher's planning can become skewed by positioning the how first. And we'll come in to this again in a few moments. And in answer to the second part of the question on the slide, well, it's important because what pupils know, remember and can do will dictate their ability to achieve well subsequently. Right, um, great. Hopefully we won't have too many difficulties with just changing between slides, but um, bear with me if, there are, if some are a little bit slow. So, um, for our inspection framework, we went further with our explanation of a quality of curriculum using these subheadings. Our definition of curriculum is that it is a framework for setting out the aims of a programme of education, including the knowledge and skills to be gained at each stage. So a clear structure and narrative of the course of learning. And that's the first subheading intent. What pe pedagogy? excuse me, pedagogy that we'll deploy, that's implementation. And then we consider impact, evaluating knowledge and understanding pupils have gained against the expectations set out in intent. So um, as, we, as I said at the start, it can be really useful to draw out this distinction between curriculum, the intent, or what is plan, planned for pupils, and pedagogy or assessment. So I'm going to begin by illustrating what, what, what we're suggesting is a useful distinction between these um, and then talk a little bit more about why we make that distinction. So um, to illustrate this, it's Thursday morning in reception class and the children are learning to recognise the letter sound correspondence M. Mm. So they are learning that the M squiggle um, corresponds to the sound Mm. And that's what's on the curriculum then. So that's what it is that um, the teacher intends that the children will learn. Then um, 
the pedagogy. How is it that those children are going to learn that letter sound correspondence? Well, they might have some um, teacher-led um, work on the mat with lots of with a with a card with mm on it and lots of repetition and and trying to make the sound. Um, and that might be followed by some sort of adult-directed activity, perhaps with Play-Doh, where the children are modelling the mm. So those are two pedagogies that might be used to help children fix in their minds the the, the link between that squiggle and the sound mm. And the assessment, well, ultimately there's the phonic screening check and of course even the, the, the further formal reading checks um, uh, as, as the children get older. But um, initially there might be some much finer grained um, uh, uh, formative assessment that's going on to check the children have learnt that in particular and to check that they continue to remember it over the next while. So um, the problem is, though, that sometimes when planning, it's easy to have the lure to move very quickly to pedagogy. So you get a curriculum topic title and you immediately think, OK, with that topic, what, how could I teach that? What activities would be nice and be, be interesting and fun for the pupils? And, and the problem is that is that there perhaps isn't enough consideration of what it is that um, you want children to learn before working out the activity by which they could learn it. And that's why we find it very useful to draw the distinction in this way, to make sure that there is the emphasis that's necessary on the what before moving on to the how. So there, that emphasis on pedagogy there. So um, we'll go a little deeper with thinking about that what, thinking about the curriculum now. And the choice of questions on this slide implies that curriculum means far more than what subjects the school chooses to teach. And we can think about curriculum on different levels. So the kind of the, the, the perhaps most obvious way when we first started talking to the sector about um, inspecting curriculum is, is the school offer. And that, that was the subject really of the first discussions and debates that began as we were developing the new framework. Um, what, what subjects should a pupil be learning depending on their phase? Um, uh, and you know, what, what, what exam entries should, what exams should pupils be entered for as they're in, when they're in secondary school? And that question of, of offer is important, and it's one that um, our chief inspector has spoken about a number of times, talking about concerns about curriculum narrowing at key stage two and at key stage three. And so, so there, there is that level of thinking about curriculum, but that's not the only level at which we think about what it is that children should learn. So for a subject, a subject leader will think, will have some much more detailed considerations to cons that they'll be thinking about when thinking about curriculum. You know, what topics should pupils learn and what would be the sequence of those topics? And that's also a really important, crucial question when thinking about curriculum. But there's also a much more granular level at which we can think about curriculum and that's at the level of the sequence of lessons and we can think about the what at that level when we think about um, what set of knowledge would make a good explanatory thread thread sorry they'll learn this then if they learn this and then they learn this they'll be able to do this you know, so within that sequence of lessons what is it that e at each stage the pupil needs to know what is it that will allow a pupil to be able to acquire that more complex concept or do that more complex activity at the end of this um, at the end of this sequence of lessons um, and and so and often a lot of successful teaching is around teachers that really take the time to consider that most granular way of thinking about curriculum and the what at the level of the sequence of lessons. So just one other point about um, that intent. Um, I've had um, in the past people ask, well, why do we need to think about curriculum when we've got um, we, we've got the national curriculum and we've got um, uh, uh, early early learning goals and we've got exam specifications? Um, and I think for that reason, often when Ofsted's talked about intent, that it's been assumed that that discussion is at the level of vision. But in fact, as our last shirt slide showed, you can think about curriculum at these different levels, the level of offer, the level of the kind of subject topic and sequencing at that level, and then the more granular um, sequencing level. And documents like the national curriculum only really set out high level goals. They don't tell you what knowledge you need to achieve those goals. Some subjects in the national curriculum like English and maths are set out in a bit more detail, but even there, there's still a lot of what thinking that needs to be done. 
And um, that's why for us intent is much more than vision or rationale. Um, and so when, when we talk to schools, we're not looking for some sort of intent statement that, that talks about um, a school's particular vision. That's that, you know, there's no particular necessity to have something of that sort. Of course, a school's ethos will pervade their thinking about what they do. And, and that's definitely well and good. But when we're talking about intent, we're talking about everything, all three of those levels. Um, and um, when we're talking to senior leaders, we're thinking about asking them how they ensure and assure a high quality curriculum in each subject. Okay, so within intent, we consider the scope of the curriculum offer, the quality of content choices and sequencing, and we also think carefully about how prior learning of content helps ensure that the curriculum is remembered. And that means that for us, the curriculum isn't just the subject or qualification offer, that top level that I talked about. Um, and it isn't just what's been assessed. It's possible to confuse the curriculum with assessment, particularly when those assessments are high stakes. But assessment outcomes are not the same as an outline of what needs to be learned for success in that assessment. And also the curriculum should not be narrowed so that only covers what the schools guess or think might be assessed. There's a whole um, breadth of learning in that domain that we've considered is important for children's education an assessment simply samples that to check through sampling that it's you know that that um, children are learning what's been taught it's also the case that um, it's not helpful necessarily to think about um, curriculum in terms of um, experience um, or a range of experiences. And obviously schools might want children to have a range of experiences and particularly experiences that they might not have otherwise in their ordinary lives. Um, but um, when we're thinking about curriculum, we're thinking about what it is that the school intends would be learned through that experience. Um, and um, when that becomes the primary first question, what is it that we would like children to learn? It also leads to much more proactive thinking about preparing children in advance of a trip, for example, or whatever the experience is to make sure they get the most from it and get from it what might be hoped by the teachers. And another, uh, another area worth clarifying is this question of a creative curriculum. Now, often when there's a discussion of a creative curriculum, all those ideas and thinking are perhaps really about what we have termed pedagogy, how it is that children are going to learn the curriculum intent rather than what it is that will be learned. So uh, I think in our terminology, that would probably become creative pedagogies. Sometimes though also, when thinking about creative curriculum, you're talking about that high level goal that children will be creative in the thing they're undertaking, whether that's maths or art, um, that they're they'll be creative and if that's the case there's still a lot of curriculum thinking needs to be done identifying what it is that children need to learn in that area so that they can be meaningfully creative in that area and use the tools apply the thinking of that domain of that subject area so uh, this takes us to the next little part of this section of the presentation, which is to talk about um, why it is that we've got this um, emphasis on curriculum in our new inspection framework. And it goes back to thinking about human cognition. And um, this particular quote is really useful in thinking about that, that why. Um, and it, it's a quote um, that is explaining the way um, learning is thought about in psychology. Um, and so the quote is, learning is defined as an alteration in long-term memory, and if nothing has been altered in long-term memory, nothing has been learned. I think a lot of people get really worried um, when they see that statement, um, and they, they get worried because they think, oh gosh, this is advocating some kind of rote learning of sort of meaningless detail with that word memory in there. And I think that's a, just a misunderstanding because um, really what, what we're talking about here is that um, when children embark on their journey in education, when they join, join a school age four, um, they, they go into that um, journey of education into the school because um, their parents, society at large wants them to learn things that they don't already know. And so um, we're simply talking about the things that children learn in school and um, that they wouldn't otherwise know. So through their schooling, there's things they learn 
um, and that means you know they, they, they know more than they did um, and that know can be know that or know how what we might call you know skills in, in the know how as well um, and memory, memory in that context is simply talking about what is now known. And that's because in psychology, um, that, 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 that is described as memory. And obviously, uh, to illustrate that, it could be forgotten, couldn't it? Or it could be remembered. Um, so that is a really useful quote for, for thinking about education. Because if children have forgotten, perhaps almost immediately, what they perhaps grasped only fleetingly, then the purpose of that lesson hasn't actually been served. And I'm going to illustrate this principle a little bit further now by showing you a passage that I'm, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And the passage illustrates why it's important that we learn and remember relevant detail if we're to understand or comprehend um, text, but also speech and everything that we encounter in the world. So as we work through the next slides, we'll find out what research tells us about this. Um, now, the, so I'll show you the quote and give you a moment to read it. There we go. So hopefully you've had a had a chance to read that as it unfolded. Um, and it, it's an illustration actually that comes from a book by a cognitive psychologist called Daniel Willingham that writes partic with particular clarity um, for teachers to help give them access into the ideas of cognitive psychology. Um, and so um, unless you'd read that book or encountered that example um, in advance, it probably doesn't make very much sense to you. It didn't make very much sense to me anyway. Um, However, if I now show you this picture uh, and we return now to that quote. Brilliant. So we are, of course, talking about the procedure for putting the washing on. And this activity illustrates, it's a simple activity, but illustrates <clears throat> a really significant point that what we know allows us to understand what we hear, read and encounter in the world. Um, and so um, we often in education, we often talk about what we want children to learn, but what they already know dictates what they will be able to learn next, because it, it, it dictates what you, you can make sense of in the future. And Daniel, Daniel, Daniel Willingham puts this really nicely. He says, language is surrounded by a cloud of taken for granted, unsaid knowledge, without which the said cannot be understood. In any communication, we infer meaning. Not everything is stated. And of course, that's why young children often say, uh, assume things of adults that they'll understand. They assume because they understand it, the adult will understand it. And as we grow up, we become more aware of what might be the likely knowledge of our audience. And we adapt what we say to um, reflect that. And then you can see just how much that applies for teachers as well. How far we as teachers, you know, we want to know what our class already know. We want our class to be familiar to us um, when teaching them because it's so much simpler to work out what we're going to teach them next. So if we think about knowledge as in what you know already, the laundry example demonstrated this key finding from cognitive psychology. It's shared knowledge that allows successful communication between strangers. Prior relevant knowledge is crucial to any capacity to understand people, the physical world, or understand the new thing that you need to learn um, because you know enough about it to be able to learn more. If you don't know the meaning of words or of social cues, it's very hard to join in. The more you do know, the easier it is to navigate and make sense of the things when they do happen. And there are really implications of this um, for education. 
The meanings of words we know therefore dictate our ability to be successful or make sense of the world and to be successful in education um, because those words represent ideas that we need to be able to understand or learn more about. But the number of words that different children might typically know can vary considerably and this can have serious implications for how they achieve. And in a seminal study for research, uh, four, years, four years, researchers recorded an average child in the professional family accumulating experience of almost 45 million words, an average child in a working class family, 26 million words, and an average child in a welfare family, this was in America, it's their terminology, um, accumulating 13 million words. Now that study was, was a first of its kind, it was brown great, well, excuse me, groundbreaking, and there's been much um, sort of refining since then. But the one basic finding remains about variation in words known, and it's been replicated many times. So if we want to give all children the opportunity, opportunities, a good place to start is through teaching a range of curriculum subjects. And that's because it's from that broad understanding that you know about the world that you were able then to um, learn new things and to comprehend what you encounter through your life. So um, the point about science, history and the arts is involved because it introduces the importance of knowledge across the curriculum for educational success, which we'll um, explore further now in, sub in these subsequent slides. If you're um, a primary teacher and you were teaching in 2016, you might well recognise this slide, uh, or the, the picture on this slide, um, and, and, and have some perhaps less pleasant memories. Um, and if you attended any of our previous roadshows, you'll be familiar with this example because we've used it before. And because we've used it before, we're not going to do this whole example again, but I am going to just talk a little bit about significance so everyone can understand. It builds neatly on the washing machine and activity and the same message about knowledge and vocabulary. So in a nutshell, what, you, what we have here is what was in 2016 the new Key Stage 2 reading test. Um, and when it was first set, pupils had real difficulties. Many pupils had real difficulties in comprehending the text in the booklet. And the reasons for these difficulties boiled down to what pupils did and didn't know, um, and therefore what they were able to comprehend because of um, what they understood about the context they were reading. So during this exercise, we invited school leaders to identify the knowledge that would be needed to and, and be need to be acquired through schooling to ensure pupils could comprehend the passages in this 2016 reading test. And the list leaders created spanned breadth of national curriculum subjects and were substantial lists. And the exercise illustrated that the poor comprehension and inaccessibility of these passages was caused by a knowledge gap because there was a lot of knowledge that pupils needed. But perhaps more disconcertingly, um, a lot of that knowledge that pupils needed was knowledge um, that was actually in the primary key stage um, one and key stage two curriculum, but hadn't been, if it had been taught, hadn't been remembered by pupils. And studying a range of literature and learning the wider curriculum, therefore, is the most important factor for sex successful comprehension. Yes, there are strategies and those strategies can be useful, but by far more important is that gradual accrual over time of knowledge that means that the pupil um, is just automatically able to infer and understand what they read because they know enough about it. Um, and yet this priority on that broader education is sometimes, you know, understandably, but in that sort of concern to get results is sidelined by schools because of that pressure. But in fact, in the long term, it is the key to success with comprehension. So um, this slide is really interesting. It sort of illustrates this point another way. And it's a point about reading more broadly, because we've talked about the number of words that pupils know, but many words aren't really used in everyday speech, but are very common in writing. In fact, around 90% of vocabulary is only regularly encountered in writing. I mean, different words there and is not commonly used in speech. And if that perhaps sounds hard, I just, so if we think about some words that were in those key stage two reading tests, monument, ancestors, symbol, weathered, inscription, 
predators, species, slaughter, drought, suffocation, rehabilitate, anatomy. All those were words on the 2016 paper. And without a well thought out curriculum, um, maybe those words wouldn't be learned. And for many children, they are relying on their formal education for that education to give them access to um, that wealth of vocabulary that comes through uh, study of subjects. And uh, the point we're making here about um, teen fiction is simply that um, it's a good thing and we want children to read, so there's no problem with teen fiction at all. The point we're making here is that there's a lot of text types with vocabulary and syntax in them that aren't the sort of vocabulary and syntax you get in that kind of text. And if we want to give our pupils choices in life, it means ensuring that they do have exposure through their study to that range of um, vocabulary and ideas that um, they will only encounter through their schooling. Um, and so academic writing provides that exposure to complex vocabulary and ideas that, that need to be grasped. So um, what do we learn from this? We think about how we read to learn new things, and this is of course true. Um, however, less focus is placed on just how much prior knowledge is needed to comprehend or understand an unfamiliar text. And as we've learned in earlier webinars and extensive research, poor readers outperform good readers when the poor readers know more about the subject matter and the knowledge of the topic trumps text complexity. And I'm just picturing in my mind, I was visiting a school only last week and there was a boy reading about football um, and a boy that, that, that was not a strong reader and gaining a lot from that passage is very visual in my mind actually at the moment to illustrate that point. We need enough relevant prior knowledge to understand new learning. It's fascinating that when readers considered weak, read the passage about something they know lots about, they actually have stronger comprehension than um, those who might be considered strong readers and that don't know anything about that. Um, and if you would normally consider yourself a, a strong reader, as I think I probably would, um, think about what it feels like when you try to read a complex text of philosophy, unless you happen to know all about philosophy or biology, another good example there, um, that there's not very much meaning that necessarily you can get from that text. And the reason is because you don't know much about the words and the ideas. So this brings us on to um, uh, another another point that we need to make about knowledge. And that's we've made the, made the point really clearly about the importance of knowledge and explained that's why we've got an inspection framework that focuses on what it is children learn, because what they learn dictates what they're going to subsequently be able to learn and thus their success in education. And um, that means, though, that we, we, we have that really important question that science ne can't necessarily answer so well. In some ways it might be able to, but, but in many ways it can't, which is what is it that we need pupils to learn? You know, what, what, what content should we select? And there are values there, um, which is why it isn't just about science. Um, we, we want uh, children to learn significant knowledge. And by that, we mean knowledge which is important for children in its own right, not just as a means to an end. So for example, when covering the Egyptians, we don't just talk about pyramids because this might help with future reading comprehension. We consider pyramids are something everyone should learn about, um, at least through their education, if they haven't encountered it another way, because they're kind of achievement of mankind. And also, you know, everyone knows about pyramids. If the pupils that come through your schooling um, don't end up going out and learning, learning about those sorts of things, they're going to feel excluded and left out when other people are talking about things that are shared that they don't understand. Um, and then, and, and, and that applies to their access to debate and ideas and politics, etc. as well. Um, we don't want people feeling being left out of that. And then, um, as well as significant knowledge, there is that really big question, what do they need to learn now? Because it will help pupils with what they're going to need to learn subsequently. Um, and so if we think a good example of that is in, uh, in maths, we think about why pupils learn times tables, um, but it, the same can be considered across subjects. And then we can think about sequencing, how it is that that is ordered. And one thing I would just say about this at this stage is that, I might commonly come across lots of discussion about sequencing, sort of disembodied, without discussion of content choices. But in fact, the real 
detailed thinking in curriculum is around content choices at those different three levels that we talked about before, um, not just at one of those levels or two of those levels, right down to the granular content choices. And when you've thought about those content choices, they immediately flow into questions of sequencing. But questions of sequencing without thinking about context choices are a little bit sort of disembodied. So when discussing sequencing, you'd, you'd sort of expect there'd be lots of discussion about content selection first. So a little bit more about um, what knowledge is that um, we, we should be putting into a curriculum. So let's imagine a school chooses to teach the Romans. Now, it could be that with the Romans topic in mind, the teacher becomes very excited and thinks, what great activities could we do about the Romans? Um, and if they do that, then they've done that thing with the boxes. They've leapt straight from the curriculum box just with the topic heading and leapt, leapt, leapt to the pedagogy box without thinking about the curriculum all you know at that lowest, more granular level in terms of what it is that we want children to learn. Um, you know, what might be transferable that children can learn to future contexts, or what is significant knowledge in its own right that we think is worthy that children should learn and know something about it for their subsequent lives. So if the teacher doesn't leap straight to the pedagogy box and starts thinking about the range of knowledge that a pupil might be able to learn about through studying the Romans, here are just some, what we, we could say vocabulary, but actually the vocabulary represents ideas or concepts that, um, and that the, vo the vocabulary is a label for that idea or concept. So there's something we want children to understand, which means that we could say that they know the meaning of the word. Um, and um, really, you know, learning from a dictionary, you know, dictionary definition isn't very helpful. And the reason for that is because it's contexts that get like the context of the Romans that gives um, vocabulary its meaning um, and, 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 it, and, and makes it something that you can understand. And so um, a well-designed curriculum might deliberately stress these concepts. Um, and um, because they're very transferable. And these ideas would be in, would enormously aid people's subsequent learning, not just in history, but actually if you have a look at some of these words across the curriculum. So words like republic, social class, taxes, rebellion, among many others, learnt in the context of, context of Rome will allow deeper understanding later. Like for example, when studying the English Civil War at secondary school, a child that comes from primary with some starting meaning for these terms is going to look, be able to to get much further in their subsequent study of the English Civil War compared with pupils that don't begin with some grasp of what these words might mean and are having to begin from scratch as they, um, uh, as, as they learn about the English Civil War. So just to say here, we're not advocating a particular curricular structure. Whether teaching is via topics or subjects, the same issues of prog progression need to be considered and planned out. Um, so we've been talking a huge amount about knowledge and I, I was talking how about when I was talking about that quote about learning being a, a changing long term memory, learning as in what is learned and now not a verb there. Um, that, that, that that can lead to sort of people getting a bit worried is it is Ofsted sort of advocating a kind of um, rote meaningless fact, uh, learning um, memorized in isolation a bit like this analogy of the bucket being filled and the bucket being equivalent to the child's mind well it, we're certainly not advocating that and in fact it isn't even possible we know that that's just simply not the way people's minds work and a better analogy for for um, what happens as you, um, what, what it looks like as you learn more things is this analogy of the web, um, a better analogy for how people hold knowledge in their mind. And it shows knowledge as an interconnected schema. For example, every time a pupil encounters a new contextual use of the word government or a younger pupil discover, you know, encounters a new use of the word river, it adds to the complexity of their understanding of that concept. It, it, it gives deeper understanding to that concept and the capacity to use that concept in their own thinking. So when we learn, we need to make new information meaningful by relating it to what we already know and thus that web grows. And we want to know what pupils know already so that we can add to that in this ever-growing web. So um, knowledge grows when humans make connections between new and what has already been learned. Um, when we when they know more and then remember more. 
So um, to illustrate that a bit further, complex knowledge webs or ski schemas, we could say, give experts the skillful capacity to encounter new problems and solve them with such ease. The more you know about something and know about the connections between related pieces of knowledge, we could say that that is, that is deeper understanding. Increasing knowledge of related content is deeper understanding. So think of someone you know who's an expert in something. What are, they, um, what are they like at learning something new within their own field? They absorb new things very quickly into their schema about the subject because they already know a lot about it. They already have a web with lots of places where you could attach new knowledge to sort of stretch that analogy a little bit. And this, this really um, changes the way you think about progress and the way we in Ofsted think about progress. Um, if pupils are learning the curriculum, they are making progress. They are enriching their schema because they know more and remember more and they're actually now better placed to think critically, solve problems, um, learn new, more complex things. So often assessment progression models don't necessarily even reference the content to be learned and yet it's, it's what it is that needs to be learned in the curriculum that, that it, it dictates progress. If you need children to learn these things, and if they do learn them, they have made progress. And now, um, really, kind of that, that phrase, the curriculum is the progression model, um, which you may have heard and Ofsted, it's, it's not our phrase, but it's one that we use. Um, it, that's all it really means in simple terms. It, it means that um, getting better is, is learning more of the curriculum rather than sort of some abstract sort of ladder of progression that doesn't relate to what is learned. Before we move on, I want to draw out two key features of an effective progression model. The first is about early years. If your setting has early years provision, this is the start of the progression model. Effective curriculums are co-produced by staff from across the whole school. It's critical to attend carefully to the knowledge that pupils will acquire in the early years. It's this knowledge that will form the bedrock of everything to come. Weak curriculums are often characterized by thinking that doesn't take adequate account of the early years or treats that phase as the secret garden. And curricular thinking must start with the early years. So it's perhaps no surprise that my second point about an effective progression model is the notion of transition. Each phase, as we've heard, creates readiness for subsequent learning. The content between key stages two and three and eventually key stage, key stage four is critical and this bridge through to secondary schooling is sometimes overlooked. So effective providers liaise with local colleagues to understand as much as is possible what the overall curriculum progression model looks like from early years right through to key stage four and beyond. And each step we're reflecting carefully on how current content is preparing pupils for subsequent learning. So we'll conclude this, this session before I hand over to um, John with um, some final reflections on the question you can see uh, at the top, some summaries of really pulling together what we've been discussing. Why is it that this focus on curriculum is necessary? Firstly, a focus on curriculum is necessary because knowledge allows comprehension, or we could say knowledge is crucial for understanding, comprehension, understanding, and that's point number one. What happens if that knowledge isn't there? This slide explores what happens when there is not a carefully sequenced curriculum to ensure pupils acquire necessary knowledge or there isn't enough attention to ensure important knowledge is remembered. And the Jenga Tower is a really good analogy to illustrate the way pupils can keep progressing through their schooling, but prior knowledge gaps make subsequent learning increasingly difficult. This is most evident in subjects like maths, but in these sessions today, we've explored how those knowledge gaps affect reading comprehension and subsequent understanding of new material in all subjects. So our next point, um, we focus on curriculum because knowledge is generative, or you could say sticky, and I'll illustrate what I mean. So research shows that we learn by relating new knowledge to what we already know, and therefore the more children know, the more they have the capacity to learn. And so you've got this, um, uh, this kind of hook hook effect here. The more hooks they've got, the more knowledge they can hook onto. Or you could think about a snowball and the way it grows. And really, that's a really good analogy when we think about the fact that you, you could say, gosh, when I think about myself as an adult, there's just so much I know. So how was it that you learned all of that? It's because there's this multiplicative effect. The more you know, you can learn vastly more, the more you know. Um, 
so a high quality, high quality curriculum thinking considers what it is that will be most useful for children to know to aid subsequent learning. So um, our next point about focus on curriculum is because skills are dependent on specific knowledge and we've touched on this point um, a little bit already. Um, and we've got an illustration here um, of what, what, what it is that is needed for um, running a marathon. And have a look, you, you've got a complex skill or action there at the top, the running of the marathon. Um, and just look at all the, what we call the component knowledge that sits underneath it. So in Ofsted, we find it really useful, useful to use these two words, component and composite. They're, we don't expect you to use them when we go on inspection, but we, we, we find them really useful way of helping us have a better debate about curriculum internally amongst ourselves. So in Ofsted, we use the word composite to describe a complex new idea or activity. And we use the word component to describe the knowledge know that or know how that pupils need to learn to achieve the composite. So here we see components at play in the marathon analogy which helps with a further key insight into curriculum design. A mistake we can sometimes make in education is to invite pupils to complete composite tasks without the necessary component knowledge. And this is problematic. If we use the marathon as an analogy, we would no less ask pupils to run the marathon without the necessary component parts to perform that composite task effectively. And curriculum is no different. Think about interventions. It's really, um, really easy to check the complex activity. The pupil can't do the complex thing. You know, they, they can't do percentages in maths. And so you have lots and lots of intervention, lots and lots of input on percentages. But actually, you know, Think about the Jenga tower. There will be weaknesses in components. There will always, if a child is struggling with what they're being asked to do, there will always be weaknesses in components down below. Um, what is it? Maybe it's facility with times table, a more basic number that's the reason why the children are struggling with doing their percentages. So the marathon analogy illustrates that desired skill or, or knowledge are not binary, separate educate or separate educational goals. Um, so you don't you sort of accrue knowledge and skill just as separate things. It's prior component knowledge, know that and know how, that gives a capacity to perform a more complex activity or what might be called, called a, a skill. And finally, um, we focus on curriculum because knowledge empowers. And crucial to the message running through this first session is the finding that the least privileged are disenfranchised if they're not taught the knowledge of other children that, uh, that other children may pick up outside school. And remember the findings of the Hart and Risley study and the vocabulary gap that exists between different groups of children. Compelling research like there has been on this area over time demonstrates the importance of knowledge for successful performance in academic tasks. So yeah, but there we go. In summary, a high quality curriculum is, pro, um, is based on proactive thinking. It will have clear consideration of the sequence of content necessary, necessary for children to make progress. It'll provide children with the knowledge they need for subsequent learning. And, it will, and it, by so doing, it builds deep understanding, the capacity for skillful performance. Um, so to reassure you, Ofsted have judged schools to be outstanding with very different and wide ranging curriculum structures. Of course, you couldn't say that anything goes um, because that, that, that could never be the case, but schools do have great flexibility um, um, in choosing structure and content. And, we, and in Ofsted, we don't dictate that. Um, but a high quality curriculum is going to need to have been constructed with thought and care as to the components that will make the composite possible. Okay, so I think that's it for me um, for the first session. So Thanks, time Heather. to hand over to John. Okay, and back to me everyone for session two then. Let's move things on. So as promised in session two, we turn our attention to memory. Now we've talked lots about remembering and cognition in session one. So we're gonna now spend a few minutes breaking down what we know about cognitive science. If we have an appreciation of how learning happens, were well placed to construct curriculums that help pupils achieve. Now, just a quick health warning in, you know, in kind of 15 minutes or so, I couldn't possibly cover the breadth of this field. So what we've got here is a really simple outline and, and any of you wishing to kind of look further, you know, there's a wealth of information out there, but please do bear that in mind as we go through. So here's that all important quote again. Now let's explore our long-term memory and indeed our working memory 
in a little more detail. Perhaps the most important thing to say on this first slide is that our long-term memory is the control center. What we've got stored in our long-term memory helps us function, answer questions, solve problems, think critically, all those things we've explored in session one. And to put it into context with session one, our long-term memory helps us complete those composite complex tasks. Our long-term memory is therefore, not surprisingly, a complex interconnected web. web. And, and schools, well, we, we exist to enrich the web. And in the last session, we referred to those webs as schemas. Now, our work in memory, well, that process is new information. But the key point here is that it has a finite capacity. It acts like a bit of a safety valve or an RCD on electrical circuit. You know when you plug the hairdryer in and the electrics cut out? Well, that's a helpful analogy. It, it's akin to our working memory saying, well, that's a bit too much load, thank you. I'll cut things off here so that things don't get too much. Our working memory can't cope with too many things being plugged in, just like overloading that electrical circuit in your own home. However, our long-term memory, well, as much as we know, well, it's infinite. It's where we keep previously learned knowledge stored in schemas. And its possibilities are endless. So learning occurs when new knowledge is transferred to our long-term memory. Now, the work in memory processes knowledge, as we've said, but it's got its limitations. And in fact, it can't really cope with more than around four items. And more about that in a few moments. As the working memory processes, it makes links to what's already known. And the more that's already known, the more sticky and generative learning can be. And moreover, the more that's already known over time, the less likely it is that working memory will be overloaded too quickly. Now, this is all crucial for novices who are embarking on new learning. And it's why we need to take things easy and chunk knowledge up. Think back to the last time you learned something new. Can you imagine the challenge of being required to remember too much too soon? Makes me think back to some learning that I've recently embarked on. I've been learning how to play the guitar. And importantly, the, the, the teacher didn't begin in like a kind of expert territory with like, I don't know, a solo from Brian May. Instead, she constructed a, like a program over a long period of time. It's carefully chunked into bite-sized chunks to help me that have that automaticity of the absolute basics. Now, I, I suspect it's going to take me a lot longer to get better, better at it. But the point here is that things were chunked up. And if they hadn't been, my working memory would have been over, overwhelmed. So we just can't store everything. And as we've heard already, the work in memory has its limitations for good reasons. But what we do know is if you think about something carefully and it's repeated and practiced, our memory knows it should be stored. As Willingham says here, your memory, bear with me, I think that's just gone off for a second. There we go. Your memory isn't a product of what you want to remember or try to remember. Rather, it's a product of what you think about. And this has huge implications for the curriculum and how we teach it. And that's why, you know, Heather emphasised the what so much throughout session one. If pupils are thinking about an activity and not the curricular goal, the thing we want remembered might not stand a chance. So that brings us neatly to four key principles to bear in mind with memory. So. Principle one. As we said in the last slide, the what must be foregrounded. At the outset of curriculum design, we should carefully decide what it is we want to be remembered in the long term memory. Let's go back to our components and composites to illustrate this point further. Like the math marathon analogy, this slide here gives us an example of kind of the possible components and the composite in art education. And you can see that the components are the building blocks that allow capacity or skill to perform a complex activity. In deciding what content needs to be remembered, our teacher here 
has carefully identified four components. Then now well placed to sequence these and consider how they will teach and assess them. So we've been thinking about what content should we ensure pupils remember? And in the next three principles, we'll move things on a little and think about how we might best help pupils remember what they learn. A few slides ago, we shared uh, that helpful quote, memory is the residue of thought. Now with principle two, we explore further why what it is pupils pay attention to is so critical. Now with this principle, the key point is that pupils will remember what they think about. And often we can see pupils kind of looking engaged in activity and a topic, you know, might seem relevant. But does the task really focus pupils attention on what it is they need to learn and understand? Here's an example in which pupils are engaged in activity. However, the activity proved to be more memorable than getting pupils to focus their attention on what they need to learn and understand. Now, there's a story on the internet of a teacher who wanted her pupils to learn about the effects of the Irish potato famine. And to make the lesson more memorable, she used an activity where she hid potatoes around the classroom for the class to find. You know, the pupils really enjoyed the activity and the teacher clearly had the best intentions. But what would her class have thought most about in the lesson? What about that lesson would have got their attention? Was it the section at the end where the class found out the social and economic effects of the famine? Or might it have been the activity? As we considered at the start of this second session, work in memory is a precious resource and can easily be overloaded. To exemplify the challenges of working memory, in a moment, you'll be shown a series of digits. You just have 15 seconds to remember as many of the digits in order as you can. Here they come. How are you doing? I don't know about you, but I find this pretty challenging. Here's one more activity for you. Focus on the screen again. Now, I suspect you can remember exactly what just came up. And the reason you can remember that sentence, which is so familiar in our culture, is because it's one chunk, not 17. It's readily remembered. There's room left in the working memory to consider meaning. So your short term or working memory is, is potentially quite bad. And when requisite prior knowledge or components are stored in the long term memory, you can learn more easily. The more you know, the more relevant component chunks are in long term memory and the more space you have to think about new learning within your working memory. So chunking needs prior knowledge. The more you know, the more you can chunk. The more you can chunk, the more space you have to think in your working memory. OK. With principle four, we now consider research based methods for aiding memory. Let's consider the question at the top of this slide. Which do you think are most likely to result in long term learning? I'll let you have a read down. So, which of those four are most likely to result in long term learning? The, the answer is just going to appear on our character on the right here now. Well, the answer is number four. The act of recall builds memory. And this is what we can describe as assessment as learning. It's also referred to the test in effect. It means that people should have plenty of opportunities to recall what they've learned previously. When testing is used to build memory, it works best when such recall exercises are short, low stakes and frequent. 
OK, let's now apply that thinking about memory back to curriculum design to tie up session two. So we design our curricular goals and endpoints and we then identify the small building blocks or components of content that will allow pupils to perform composite end goals, really tricky things. These are our components. They're appearing now on your screen and you'll see them as different colored circles. Next, we'll pay attention to what we know is already in the long-term memory. What are we connecting this knowledge to? And based on what we know, we'll need to chunk and sequence the components carefully. Here are those components being sequenced. As you can see, some, as they come in here, need to be taught more than once, so they become really sticky. We know that they'll need a really high storage strength. Think back to our you know, examples from early with history. We'll then teach the components and use formative assessment to check the extent to which they are being retained by pupils. We need to keep checking for retention, remembering that our work in memory can easily become overloaded and we're prone for all the right reasons to forget things. As we assess, we'll identify which components children seem to be remembering well and which might need to be repeated again. And remember what we've said. One of the biggest determiners of how these components are remembered is what is already known. On the right hand side, we can see the components that are already known. And as we teach new components, pupils make links to what is already known, and this helps guard against being overloaded. We repeat and practice the components as much as is required and make sure that pupils build automaticity and then they can successfully transfer the knowledge to their long-term memory. I think we just got there with all of the animation as well, so I hope that worked for you. Okay, so here are some key messages from session two. As we've seen, understanding how memory works is crucial for building an effective curriculum. And you know, we need to be alert to the limitations of working memory and bear in mind that planned repetition and practice is key. And of course, once we've got that automaticity and recall, we've got that greater capacity for skillful cognitive performance of those trickier things we talked about, those end goals. OK, we said that would be relatively short, everyone. And as we promised, you know, there's a world and, and breadth of literature out there should you want to read further. So on to session three. So a quick recap. Let's briefly zoom out as we reach the kind of hour marker in our presentation. So in session one, we summarised the key principles for building an effective curriculum. And in that last session, we considered that an appreciation of how memory works is crucial for building an effective curriculum. And if you remember, we pivoted around an important quote from Sweller, if nothing in the long term memory has been altered, nothing has been learned. And we also thought then about the limitations of working memory and the need for planned repetition and practice. So on to session three. We now just want to spend a few minutes with you sharing our latest research and you'll have perhaps seen our recent series of, of research reviews. So, so this brief session allows us to explain how those reviews have, have come about, the bigger project that they're part of and how they can be a useful reference point as you plan your curriculums in the current climate. So everyone, in session one, we asked ourselves, what knowledge do pupils need to learn? Remember, we, we talked about significant knowledge and what might be emphasised in the course of a scheme of work. Now, to make these decisions, you know, leaders and teachers obviously need a reasonable amount of subject knowledge. You know, lots of local authorities, trusts, individual schools regularly approach us asking us to you know, speak about subjects and particularly with the dawn of the education inspection framework. 
and these requests have become even more frequent you know and of course as, as we've explored this is quite a complex space you know subjects are disciplines in their own right choosing the knowledge is tricky so there are different knowledge structures and they're distinctive but they've got shifting traditions now we hope that this session and the subsequent webinars from our subject leads will break down some of the potential complexity of these knowledge structures and provide you with a really useful reference point as you develop your own workforce. What I've said, we've got a really proud history of undertaking you know, work to you know, paint a picture of subject quality across England. And over the last 18 months, we've invested further in this work and formed a curriculum unit. And that's where you know, Heather and I hail from. So we want to spend a little time in this session explaining this work in more detail. And as I've said, we hope it provides a useful reference point. To help structure our thoughts, I'll work through the bullets you can see on the slide here. So we're going to consider the context we're in, introduce our subject leads and the work they've been doing. Um, we'll have a little look at science. Hopefully I've got a video that's going to work for you and then I'll signpost you to some others. And, and then we'll talk about the other areas that we'll be covering as well. And, and as you know, of course, you'll be hearing directly from two of our subject leads in the next webinar in this series. So coupled with our coverage of um, early reading, um, this session and subsequent webinars will provide you with a grounding in a generous spread of the national curriculum. So as I've said, we've got a proud tradition of publishing subject work. And since our inception in 1992, we've provided you know, what you might call state of the nation reports that inform and shape the debate, uh, debate sorry, around providing an effective education. So we know from session one, curriculum is at the heart of our education inspection framework. We know that schools and providers want to further enhance their curriculum expertise. As I said in the introduction, you know, we're frequently asked to talk at events. We've been proud to share our work more widely, and of course with you today. And to further strengthen our work and offer as much support to the sector as possible, we've expanded the role of our former national leads. We've recruited a new team of subject leads who now form our curriculum unit. And they spend half of their time in the field inspecting and the other half working on projects. Now, before I introduce our subject leads and explain their work further, just a note regarding the pandemic. You know, the, the curriculum work I'm describing here and everything we've talked about, you know, planned long before COVID-19, but, you know, we do feel it's timely. As you face the challenge of you know, catching up, we can call it, you'll be thinking carefully, as we've done throughout today's webinar, about what content to prioritise, what to limit and what to omit. So by setting out the most helpful ways of securing progression in each subject, which is, you know, the work we're going about now in the curriculum unit, we hope we can provide you with a set of guiding principles. Forgive me, the screen's just bouncing around a little. Just trying to get my main screen back up. Bear with me, everyone. I think it's back now. So let's explore this work and our subject leads in a little more detail. Here's our team of subject leads. We've got colleagues spread all over the country, which is great in terms of the ongoing training and support we offer to our offset inspectors and HMI. And for those of you on a Twitter or if you followed you know, gov.uk announcements, you'll probably notice many of these colleagues' names. And you'll perhaps notice that we don't have a subject leads, a course for uh, you know so, so social uh, science and DT. And if those areas do interest you, you know, do look out for our next round of recruitment. Right, as we've already outlined, our subject reports are important reference points for the sector. And each of our subject leads are currently in the process of writing new state of the nation reports. However, the path to producing a report begins with our established EIF principles. We use these principles and other factors, which I'll describe in our next slide, to filter all of the available and relevant literature in the given discipline. Once we've gathered the available literature, we consider what it tells us about high quality education in each subject. 
we can then use this concept of quality, if you like, to help us look at what we see on inspection. The EIF allows us to gather rich evidence on the quality of subject education using our deep dive methodology. And these findings and our research can then be used to write our final subject reports. In the last slide, I mentioned filters that we use when we consider research. Well, these are apps outlined um, on the slide here. You can read about them in more detail in the paper. You can see from that clip, that snip on the screen. When selecting literature for the reviews, we're drawing on research that aligns with the established principles, sorry, for our quality of education judgment. And that was all outlined really in session one with Heather. We hope that publishing our evidence base for how we have developed our understanding of subject quality will provide insight both on what evidence we have used and on how we have interpreted that evidence when creating research criteria for our subject reports. So put simply, we select research with an understanding that curriculum is different from pedagogy. As we know now, curriculum is about what teachers teach and when and what pupils learn, not how they teach. A distinction you know, we've made really clear throughout this session. As we know from session two, in recent decades, we've seen a knowledge explosion in the field of cognitive science. It's given us a growing insight into how people learn. And that important body of work has informed our thinking in developing our frameworks. And all our research and evaluation work must be relevant to our role as a regulator and inspectorate. And relevance to the evaluation criteria set out in our frameworks is therefore a key fil filter. Now, with those principles in mind, our subject leads have begun writing their research review, and in recent weeks, we've begun to publish this work. In a moment, I'll share a short video that explains you know, what we're doing in more detail. But I want to first just talk briefly about the overall structure of the reports. Now, you'll recognize much of these words um, from previous slides. And while we don't have time to unpick these in detail now, it's helpful to offer some brief explanations of each bullet. So here are our focus areas for the research reviews. When we talk about scope, we mean the extent to which the subject matches or exceeds the breadth of the national curriculum. As we know, components refers to how teachers identify those small building blocks of content that allow pupils to understand more complex ideas. Sequencing is about the positioning of the components so that subsequent learning is made possible. You know, what goes where and why? Rigor, well, that's about subject specificity. Does the curriculum consider subject specific questions and over time help pupils to learn, you know, the methods, conventions, rules and practices of the subject? Pedagogy, as we explored at the start, do teachers have secure subject knowledge so that they can make meaningful decisions about how they teach content? Assessment, are we confident about why, when and how to assess in a subject? Are important concepts such as kind of why teaching of the subject domain rather than to the test recognized and understood? And finally, systems. And this kind of includes you know, professional development. How are staff supported to develop their subject knowledge over time? Now we've compiled uh, a number of videos for each subject and I'll, I'm just gonna try and play one of them now. I'm hoping the technology is gonna work here. I, I think it was a reliable the other day, so fingers crossed. And this could gives you kind of a, you know, hopefully a neat introduction um, in this case into science. So just bear with me a second.
hopefully I'm back everyone and that was a, a useful uh, video to see. We've got them available in uh, our other subject areas as well. So as we've seen from that introductory video, the research reviews provide you know, with, you with an overview of, of what research tells us about high quality education. Now you'll have perhaps spotted at the start of the animation that it's a science specialist read our review. J just to reassure you, we've structured the reviews in such a way that they can offer something for all audiences. And if you're a specialist in the subject, they'll provide very useful insight. And if you're a non-specialist, the report is structured so that summaries, takeaways are as clear as possible. And I'll show you some of that just in a moment. Each subject lead has recorded two videos to introduce their work. Uh, in the first, they outline what it means to get better in their subject. And in the second, they talk about some of the key principles that can influence you know, the quality in their subjects. And these videos are available from social media through our Twitter feed and we'll be releasing clips for several other subjects throughout the summer term and if you have a moment you know we'd, we'd invite you to kind of you know uh, have a look at them before you perhaps read the research reviews now i mentioned the structure of reviews a moment ago so here are some snips from the uh, science research review you'll see it provided examples of how we summarize sections before we provide more detail and how we offer what we hopefully are useful takeaway features and this structure is a feature of all reviews. So hopefully as you, you find our reviews online, um, you can easily navigate them and there's something for everyone there. And that brings us um, to our closing slide for session three. I, I hope you found the session helpful in, uh, in terms of an introduction of the curriculum unit and the work that we're doing in a moment. You know, and we, we very much look forward to sharing our subject reports in the fullness of time and hope that our research reviews provide useful insight as you construct and renew your own curriculums. And we now head to our final session and I'll be handing back um, to Heather, everybody. Over to you, Heather. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, everybody. So this la last um, brief session turns to catch up, or that's how we've described it. And do forgive us, I think none of the terms that might be used, catch up, recovery, et cetera, all are perfect. So, um, but I think we know what we're talking about here. Um, so, um, in your schools, you'll have been thinking hard about the best way forward um, to help your pupils. Ah, here we go. And um, especially those that can least afford to miss any schooling. And there's a lot of discussion around pupils um, and, and receiving extra teaching. But it does really matter what children learn in extra time provided and in their day-to-day -day curriculum now that they're back at school. And so ju just to kind of illustrate that and, and some of the challenges when thinking about what to do to help children that have missed lots of schooling, consider some sort of generic advice. Um, step one, access, uh, assess to identify gaps. Step two, organize interventions for pupils with gaps. So it seems you know, perfectly innocuous and, and reasonable advice to give. But just we pause for a moment and think, which of the following two teachers would find this advice most useful? A year one teacher of phonics, we could also suggest they're a key stage three maths teacher for the secondary audience. So, and B, a year eight geography teacher, um, or, or in fact, a, a geography in year five or six would do the same thing. So there's that advice. And so identify gaps, organise interventions for pupils with gaps. So for that year one phonics teacher, identify gaps. That would be really useful advice because teachers need to know which content the phonics programme pupils remember or learned remotely. But what about the year eight geography teacher? Identify gaps. Well, the topic of rivers was missed as it was to be taught in spring 2020 and no child was taught it. So to assess the knowledge of the rivers, would topic would be unhelpful. So you wouldn't be wanting to do an assessment to identify gaps. That second instruction then, organise interventions for pupils with gaps. So again, for the year one phonics teacher, or think about maths, the same, different children will have different gaps in their phonic knowledge and some may be disproportionately behind others and catching up will require ongoing targeted teaching. So this seems like a really good idea in the case of year one phonics. Year eight geography, well, there isn't a target group needing special catch-up arrangements because no pupils learned about rivers last year. So in fact, that advice applies well to some subjects or phases and, and not to other subjects. And to illustrate that further, here's another piece of advice. 
adjust your curriculum content. Again, it seems like a really sound and sensible piece of advice, and, and indeed, in some ways it is, except let's think about year one phonics, adjust your curriculum content. Absolutely not. Each part of the phonics program must be taught in the sequence prescribed. You can't just leave, you know, if you're thinking about as you're learning your letter sound correspondences, you can't just sort of say, well, we'll dispense with some of those. It doesn't matter if children go through life not recognizing mm. Um, clearly not. Um, so you need to carry on as before um, in that way. Year eight geography, adjust your curriculum content might actually be a really sensible option. For example, a subsequent relevant topic might be extended to cover the most crucial misdetail about rivers in this case. So um, the point being made here, uh, just briefly, um, is that we, when thinking about helping children that have missed a lot of schooling, we need to take actions that are appropriate for subject and phase and, and general instructions aren't necessarily appropriate for all and can actually sort of counterproductive, unnecessary work and time that is a distraction from what's most important. And moving on from that, we've talked a bit about assessment already, but um, insofar as assessment may be useful in identifying needs arising from mislearning, it's better to use focused assessment, which targets specific components of knowledge or skill in precise ways. So, for example, a past paper or another test, which covers a wide range of content, will not allow you easily to infer what the precise learning gaps are that um, by looking at data created, you don't identify the components as easily from that sort of a test. Using data generated to create intervention groups therefore could be unhelpful and this is because different people in that intervention group that, that sort of been organized around data will need to relearn different content and the intervention may well be poorly targeted what is it that they all need to learn and on the other hand a test or quiz focused on salient aspects of a specific topic will tell you who has learned it and how well so formative assessment of specific course content is likely to be much more useful than say skills ladder type assessment which you often see for humanities subjects and this is because expertise in any area requires a huge amount of specific knowledge of that area. So a child can perform extremely well when they know lots about the topic and then very badly in the next assessment if they know much less. And thus for school's purposes, these are not a reliable way for checking a child is making progress. So I've the, now got a series of slides that I've shown you before and I'm just applying them to catch up here as we finish together. So progress we've said is when children learn what is intended that they should learn as set out in the school's curriculum. So it's less helpful to think about and assess progress by checking anything else. If pupils are learning the curriculum, they're making progress, they're enriching their schema. As they know and remember more, they're better placed to think critically, solve problems. Time's not infinite. And so you want to identify what content from missed topics you should prioritize and cover in your subsequent curriculum if that is the best approach. And these could be thought of as the gold nuggets here in this illustration of panning for gold, the most precious, or in this case, the most useful content for the future. And that advice applies in many subjects, such as geography, history, citizenship, religious education, where gaps in knowledge in one topic may not be as critical for future progression in other topics. So it may be most production, productive that remediation of the mislearning should be through subsequent adjustments to your curriculum. Um, in this situation, you need to identify what the missed content is to prioritize. So in these subjects where pupils gradually learn more topics which can be feasibly taught in a different order, an assess gap fill approach won't tend to work so well, but might work well in those more hierarchical subjects like maths or in phonics. But it does require thinking about that question, what is the most significant knowledge? So just a little reminder here of that previous slide. Back to that example from history. So you'll remember we saw it in session one, and this example helps illustrate the concepts that pupils might have learned by studying the Romans topic. But what happens if some or all pupils miss the Romans topic due to lockdown? Those concepts would they would have learned and would support subsequent learning and missing knowledge that will affect the pupil's ability to learn subsequent topics. You can identify the concepts you know your pupils will find useful for subsequent learning to ensure this vocabulary or I could say concepts are learned through meaningful examples. Teachers might choose a particular aspect or narrative in a period which demonstrates key features or explores key concepts. Teachers could also choose to briefly return to previous or missed topics, although in less depth and with a clear focus on what elements are most important for future topics. So in the end, we you you can't you can't magic more time as in Harry Potter, but um, um, you, you can prioritize. 
So curriculum adjustments, by, just to make this clear in this discussion, isn't, we're not talking here about adaptive teaching. We're referring to the curriculum decision about what, that, what will be necessary given that all pupils have probably missed content. The goal is to plan a curriculum which ensures key content is still covered. So we've already discussed the way subjects are different and the same actions are not appropriate in all subjects to a catch up. So in subjects like maths, you can't miss a topic because the knowledge is so hierarchical and same with phonics. However, it can instead, therefore, be tempting to rush through the topics to gain coverage. But if pupils don't learn necessary content, then they'll fall further, further down, they'll fall, fail, sorry, further down the line. And pupils need enough practice to remember crucial content long term. So there are some ways time can be optimised though, and our next point considers what adjustments could be helpful in thinking about that optimisation. So there's nearly always at least some sort of silver lining to the clouds we encounter in life, I, I suppose. And there's one repeated positive that we hear from teachers arising from remote learning, and it's the laser focus remote teaching gave to teaching activity choices in remote learning. Um, in remote teaching, there's so much to distract pupils and activities need to be very sharply focused on ensuring pupils pay attention to the most important, crucial detail they needed to learn. And it's worth considering how much more children can learn when activities are time efficient and really effectively ensure pupils focus their minds on the most crucial content to be learned. Sort of reflect back to that potatoes example that um, John was giving earlier. So we know from research that discovery learning approaches are not efficient when you are first learning new content. We also know that it's easy for children to latch onto the wrong detail. Um, for example, if in Egyptians they're um, making their friends into mummies, wrapping them in toilet roll, perhaps that's, that's what they'll think about and it's very time consuming and they won't necessarily learn about re Egyptian religious beliefs from that activity. So curriculum content can be or is in and of itself innately fascinating. We want pupils to enjoy lessons and remember the content we've chosen as important for their education. So choosing time efficient strategies using or time efficient activities, I should say, using effective strategies will allow pupils to progress more rapidly through the curriculum. And remember this quote from Daniel Willingham we used in session two, it's really helpful. It reminds us that pupils will learn more when teachers' activities focus pupils' minds on thinking about most about the content we, we want them to learn. It's always worth reflecting um, all, for all of us as in, in the different ways we teach on what is it that um, the person, that, that the pupil um, um, is thinking about, actually thinking deeply about through this activity. And that takes me to the end of this section and to, to the end of our presentation. So um, in summary on this section four around catch up, I've just got a few pointers. So make actions appropriate for the subject and phase. And we spoke about the differences. Use assessment widely. Identify which knowledge is most significant when choosing what to insert into an adjusted curriculum. Ensure people still have the time they need to repeat or practice crucial content so that it is remembered long term and choose teaching activities which are time efficient and most effective to ensure the planned content is learned. So that was a very quick whistle stops tour around catch up and so I'll hand over now. Thanks Kate. Thank you so much Heather and to Jonathan as well um, for managing to, to give so many of the messages um, that, that sit behind our education inspection framework and the research behind that very very much appreciated so thank you both and thank you to of course all of our audience for, for coming and joining us and taking time out of your really busy days um, to join us and listen in to this session. There have been some questions coming in the chat bar and we have had some questions sent in to us through the email address um, in the region. We are definitely going to be picking those up. We'll have more time in our next sessions. So next week we have our primary session about languages and history. We'll make sure that we're leaving time to pick up the questions you've already asked us and give some responses to those and then consider whether actually it would be useful to you to have another similar kind of questions and answers session um, or another subject area indeed that, that we add on to the end of this series. So so thank you again to everyone um, involved in today's session and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.